Back in the day, I spent my primary education in a school that split its entire student population into two groups. Think Hogwarts, except instead of four houses, we just had two, green and blue. And just like Hogwarts, every student was sorted into a respective side when we first enrolled in the school. I was placed on the green team, which is kind of ironic given despite being on the green team for 11 years, blue is my favorite color. And through the years, I've developed a general disgust for things associated with green and generally favor anything blue, including my choice of seeker, Thundercracker. So the reason I bring all this up is because I wanted to talk about some Decepticon Seekers. And not just any Seekers, but the original iconic trio of Starscream, Thundercracker, and Skywarp, all introduced way back in 1984. Now, I've already made quite the extensive episode on my hands-down favorite, Thundercracker, and it's not like Starscream needs any more attention. So this time around, I'd like to focus on the third Seeker, who is not blue, Skywarp. Now even from the start, Skywarp already had one important distinction from his two Seeker brothers. While both Starscream and Thundercracker were pretty much direct transfers from their original Diaclone fighter and acrobat type jets respectively, there was no Diaclone equivalent for Skywarp. Skywarp was added on by Hasbro as a third Seeker character to most likely beef up the Decepticon ranks who were sorely outnumbered in the first wave of Transformers toys. So you can say that Skywarp was a fully 100% made American Seeker, a detail that will serve as a nice callback later on in his story. Skywarp's initial tech spec labels him as the sneakiest of the Decepticons and one who loves to play cruel pranks on them. He's also apparently not very smart and lacks initiative to do anything without proper supervision from his leader, Megatron. Which is probably why in the cartoon, after randomly being the first Transformer to be repaired by Teletran 1, his first act was to revive Megatron which, to his credit, was the right thing for him to do. Even as a kid, I never quite latched onto Skywarp. I mean, yes, admittedly I thought that he had the best color scheme among the three Seekers, but any positive reaction to him by me was simply based on his close association to Thundercracker. Unfortunately, just like Thundercracker, Skywarp had the unenviable position of being just the proverbial bridesmaids to Starscream's bride. He was constantly overshadowed by his more popular Seeker brother and was basically reduced into a one-dimensional thug in the original Transformers cartoon and comics. Even his very special and unique ability of being able to teleport wasn't enough to make Skywarp stand out or make a difference. And when his toy was discontinued a couple years later, his character was promptly killed off in both the comics and the 1986 animated movie. Fortunately, despite dying in said movie, his body was later used as material by Unicron to create a new and more formidable Decepticon who may or may not be Cyclonus. See, while it's widely accepted that Thundercracker was reformatted into the Decepticon Huntsman Scourge, Skywarp has been a part of one of the most hotly debated arguments in the Transformers community, right up there with whether Frenzy is red or blue. He's red, by the way. Thanks to being in the background of the frame behind the more featured Insecticon Bombshell, there are quite a number of fans who believe that it was actually Bombshell who was reformatted into Cyclonus and Skywarp into his Armada. For the record, I belong to the Skywarp is Cyclonus camp. I mean, for me, it makes more sense given that Thundercracker turned into Scourge to have the two other original Seekers continue on in upgraded forms alongside Galvatron. And they're both jets, so there's that. And ultimately, if I were Cyclonus, I'd like to believe that I originated from an elite Seeker rather than some bug. Now, while I never had the original Skywarp toy, I have since gone on to build up quite the sizable Skywarp collection. Okay, to be more precise, a quite sizable Seeker collection. As by extension to my love for Thundercracker, I have become a self-labeled Seeker whore who will buy just about any version of Thundercracker, Starscream, and Skywarp from my collection. And given that the Seeker trio are basically an easy 3 for 1 way to make money for Takara or Hasbro, there have been quite a lot of versions of these guys released through the years, and I have amassed quite the collection. One thing I have noticed though is that of the three, more often than not, Skywarp is either the last to be released or one of the hardest to obtain, or both. My first modern day Skywarp was the Classics version released in 2006. And granted that the original Classics Thundercracker was hands down the hardest to obtain, being part of a 2007 BotCon exclusive multi-pack, Skywarp wasn't that easy to get either as he was packed in a Versus 2-pack with a white pr- I mean Ultra Magnus. I remember that I was just getting back into collecting toys again and holding said 2-pack in my hand in a store, with the storekeeper doing her best to convince me to buy it. I was so close to pulling the trigger before I ultimately backed out. A decision I would regret later on as the set would skyrocket in price when the third-party company Fans Project released their City Commander Upgrade Kit for White Prime a few months later. 
It took a while, but I eventually found a loose classic Skywarp on eBay. And as for Thundercracker, I ended up repainting an easily obtainable classic Starscream, my very first ever attempt at a painted custom. And that's how I eventually got my first modern Seeker set. Another set I almost completed, although this was more of a case of dodging a bullet, was the Titanium series of which both Thundercracker and Starscream were released in retail. I got myself a Thundercracker, but that toy was so awful, I aborted my plans to complete this set immediately, even when the trio was completed with a Skywarp release a year later as a higher priced exclusive. I admit even after all these years, I have been tempted every now and then to track down this set. Given that they were based on some awesome pre-Earth designs created by fellow Filipino and up to now one of the best Transformers artists ever, Don Figueroa. But in the end, I ended up satisfying my need for a Cybertronian Seeker Trio first with 2012's Fall of Cybertron, of which once again, Skywarp was initially only available as a more expensive Japanese Takara release. On the live-action movie front, Skywarp would also prove initially difficult to obtain. Once again, the original Voyager Seeker mold was released on retail as Starscream and Thundercracker, but Skywarp was nowhere to be found. In order to complete this trio, I once again opted to go the custom route, painting an extra Starscream into Skywarp. Eventually though, an official live-action Skywarp would be released, once again as an exclusive from Walmart, a store that does not exist in my country. And given the higher price, I initially passed in it, opting to complete a smaller deluxe set of these guys instead. But eventually, I finally found a reasonably priced Voyager that I immediately picked up, because, you know, seeker whore. Years later, I would get another pre-Earth trio from the Siege War of Cybertron toy line. At the time of the initial launch, I was in denial, not wanting to collect yet another retail Transformers line. I figured I would get to them eventually seeing both Starscream and Thundercracker were filling up store pegs like nobody's business, and Skywarp, although being an Amazon exclusive, seemed to be just a click away. Anyway, for those in the know, you know where this story is headed. By the time I decided to finally get these guys, Skywarp was nowhere to be found and had become one of the most highly sought out and highly priced Transformers in the secondary market. I had all but decided to chalk this up as a lost cause when fate decided to throw me a bone. One random early morning at around 4 a.m., my then one-year-old daughter woke up crying uncontrollably. And so while my wife tried to calm her down, I decided to surf the web a little since I was already awake. It wasn't long before I came across a sales post on Facebook Marketplace, literally just a few minutes old. There were all three seed seekers, including Skywarp, selling for well under $100. While it's generally not a good idea to make any impulse purchases when you're half asleep, this was a no-brainer. I called dibs, and the next day I finally got my Siege Seekers. And just to add a little to this great score for me, the next day I was DM'd by another fellow collector saying how lucky I was as I had just beat him to the set. Wow, talk about perfect timing. What started out as possibly a bad dream for my little girl ended up in a dream come true for me. And finally, we have the Studio Series Bumblebee Movie Seekers. Once again, Starscream and Thundercracker were easy gets. And while it took a little longer this time around, Skywarp is finally on his way. And having learned my lesson from my Siege ordeal, this Skywarp is already on my pre-order list on Amazon. Despite not getting much love in the original cartoon and comics, in his own little way, Skywarp has managed to make very sporadic appearances or close appearances in later Transformers shows. But before we get into that, I hope you won't warp away when I ask you to subscribe to my channel if you like what you're watching. If you're already subscribed, say hey in the comment section below and let me know which your favorite seeker is. And as always, thank you for all your support. So in 2007's Transformers Animated, Skywarp made his debut in the second season of the series with a twist. This time around, instead of being fellow Seeker brothers, Skywarp and Thundercracker, along with Ramjet, Sunstorm, and Slipstream, were actual clones of Starscream, with each of them embodying a specific personality trait of the Decepticon. Skywarp seemingly got the short end of the stick as he took on the cowardly side of Starscream's personality. And then, in the following series after animated, Transformers Prime in 2010, Skywarp was originally planned to be included, but was switched out last minute by the newest Decepticon named Skyquake. While I can't confirm it, it's widely speculated that the reason for this switch was because it was planned from the very start that this would be a one-off character to be killed off at the end of the episode. And so instead of wasting an already established character name, they decided to go with a more obscure one. 
Aside from both names starting with Sky, the parallels to Skywarp are further solidified when Skyquake's twin brother, Dreadwing, who sported a blue color scheme very similar to Thundercracker, made his debut later on in the series, and who also had an honor-driven personality like Cracker. And while Skyquake himself was colored green instead of the traditional black and purple Skywarp ensemble, it's worth noting that way back in the beginning, according to the original Transformers production bible, Skywarp's write-up had him described as colored olive drab, just like Skyquake. Hmm, it must have been his green colored origin that led me to prefer his blue brother. For the record though, a green seeker would eventually see the light of day in the Decepticon Acid Storm, who made his debut as part of another seeker trio that remained on Cybertron, lovingly referred to by fans as the Rainmakers. And while he initially came in a very bright neon green color, later toys of him had him in a little more darker shade of green. Anyway, just like his fellow seeker brother Thundercracker, fortunately Skywarp managed to get a little bit more spotlight on him thanks to the comic company IDW. And while his story arc wasn't as compelling as Cracker in my opinion, it did enough for me to make him a more interesting character in my eyes and gave me a greater appreciation of his oftentimes strained relationships with his fellow Seekers. It was quite abrupt, but the very first time Skywarp actually showed some sense of a personality was during the miniseries All Hail Megatron in 2009. While I won't go into the details of the entire story, in the final battle of the series, in an act of desperation, a defeated Megatron plays his final trump card with a nuclear bomb set to destroy the helpless Autobots and the rest of New York City. Seeing this as an act of dishonor, Thundercracker breaks ranks and single-handedly saves the day by disposing of the bomb himself. And almost instantly, it's his brother Skywarp who confronts him, without waiting for an explanation, accuses him of betrayal and takes out his own brother with a direct shot to the face. I know it's just a few frames, but I really love this reaction from Skywarp, just as much as I loved Thundercracker's turn. I could feel the anger and the sense of betrayal seething from the oftentimes overlooked Seeker. You could tell it was very personal. Throughout the rest of the IDW run, Skywarp continued his fight against the Autobots up until the time he was gravely injured by a very violent RC who impaled him with her sword while he was in mid-teleportation. While he survived, he survived in a non-solid state with a real danger of him ultimately fading out of existence. Given his desperate circumstances, Skywarp ultimately threw in his lot with the ancient Decepticon Galvatron, who promised to repair him for his loyalty. Unfortunately for Skywarp, Galvatron went back on his promise and merely hooked him up to a machine to use for his own teleportation needs. Left with no other option, Skywarp turned to the Earth Defense Council for help. To their credit, they were able to restore Skywarp into his solid state by deactivating his teleportation powers. Given their partial success and their effort to ultimately restore his teleportation powers, Skywarp remained loyal to the EDC and their eventual successors, America's highly trained Special Mission Force, G.I. Joe, wherein despite his rather abrasive personality, struck up an unlikely partnership, or dare I say, friendship, with the Joe Machine Gunner, Rock and Roll. Now how's that for a nice callback? A 100% stateside created Decepticon, now ending up as a real American hero. In the end of the IDW universe, Skywarp and his often strained relationship with his Seeker brothers comes full circle, as in, in the final battle with Unicron, they are reunited for one last run against the Planet Eater. Thundercracker initially finds himself isolated from his brothers and is about to be run through by one of Unicron's minions before Skywarp, heroically, ports in front of his brother and takes the blade himself. What is it with Skywarp and getting impaled by blades? Anyway, fighting together, both Thundercracker and Skywarp ultimately manage to survive until the end, further solidifying their brotherly bond. Finally, I'd like to mention the latest iteration of Skywarp in the more gritty comic series by the new Transformers license holder, Image Skybound Comics. Since this is a more recent story, I'd like to put out a quick spoiler warning in case you have any plans of checking it out, which I highly recommend. So the story starts in a familiar place with the Decepticons and Autobots crashed on Earth. And like the original cartoon, Skywarp is one of the first and only Decepticons initially resurrected by Teletran 1 before the computer is apparently destroyed by Prime to prevent even more Decepticons from getting resurrected. Unfortunately, like the original cartoon, Skywarp is once again reduced to an evil cliché thug. Anyway, very early on, Skywarp gets extremely damaged by Prime. And given the desperate situation, his fellow Decepticons Soundwave and Starscream literally rip him to pieces for parts to be used to repair Teletran 1. 
And that's where he currently remains, a literal ghost in the machine, fused to Teletran 1, but still managing to be a nuisance to the Autobots even in this semi-conscious, scrambled-up state. What is it with Skywarp and being strapped to machines? Hopefully, this won't be the last we'll see of him in the series. So yeah, he may not have been one of the best seekers of the bunch in my opinion, but by association, Skywarp has managed to be one of my favorites and one of the most heavily represented in my Transformers collection. And speaking of association, if you want to know a little bit more about Skywarp's unlikely human buddy, why not watch this episode on the original 13 G.I. Joes, of which Rock and Roll is a part of, here. Or if you want to stick to Transformers, check out my playlist over here. Either way, thanks for watching and I hope you come back for more.